last talk will be given by Mark Samama, that of course everybody knows, and he's going to present one of uh, an, uh, a subject which is so important, who is uh, he's really Mark, an expert in, in this field, bridging VKA. Mark, should we? Thank you very much, uh, Ariel, and I'd like to thank the organizer to allow the older speaker to elaborate on older drugs, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Let me show you my disclosures. I have some disclosures dur during the last three years, but I'm, as I'm part of the uh, ACCP 10th ongoing guidelines on perioperative management of antithrombotic drugs, I've, I'm no more allowed to have some disclosures, to, so you may notice that all the disclosures have disappeared. And I also thanks Thank to Nadia Ozanshir for her slide. Ten years ago, or a little bit more than ten years ago, the national health authorities in France have issued some recommendation about the management of their vitamin K antagonists, and especially for uh, people uh, requesting anticoagulation for procedure with uh, vitamin K interruption, there were two possibilities. The first one uh, was a patient with atrial fibrillation without any embolic event, let's say moderate risk, and also for the patient with venous thromboembolism uh, with a moderate risk. For this patient, vitamin K antagonists should only be stopped without any bridging, and then they should be restarted either uh, rapidly or not, but uh, uh, 48 to uh, 72 hours period was safe, or heparin could be used uh, at therapeutic dose if the surgical bleeding uh, risk was controlled. The more severe patient with uh, either mechanical valve, any valve, atrial fibrillation with a high risk and a history of transient ischemic attack or stroke, at that time the SHAD score, the SHAD VAT score were not already used, uh, but this may equal to a SHAD score of five to six or a SHAD VAT score of six, seven, or eight or nine, and last but not least, the patient with venous thromboembolism within the three last months or with recurrent idiopathic thromboembolic events, meaning that two episodes with at least one event with no triggering factor, then a bridging should be organized. This is a very small subset of patients. This patient should be bridged either with sub-Q unfractionated heparin or sub-Q lomerical heparin, four to five therapeutic uh, sub-Q injection, and then the INR should be controlled preoperatively. Vitamin K antagonists should be restarted exactly the same way as in the first group, within 48 to 72 hours, or heparin should be given a therapeutic dose if the surgical bleeding risk was controlled. This was in 2008. In 2012, Siegel uh, performed a meta-analysis, including study with patient with atrial fibrillation, mechanical heart valve, and venous thromboembolism. And it was obvious that comparing bridging patients with patients who were not bridged, there were no difference with regard to the thrombotic risk, but there was a three time increase in the bleeding risk for the patient who were bridged. So these data, even if uh, the studies were small, these data were really clear to uh, give the first uh, warning against uh, bridging. Then came the bridge study, which was the first randomized double-blind placebo control study including about uh, 1,900 patients who were split into two groups, one group receiving uh, bridging therapy and one group with, who, which was not bridged. In this patient, warfarin, which was the main anticoagulant, was stopped at day minus five, nothing was given at day minus four, and at day minus three, two, and one, either placebo or daltepine 100 units per kilo, twice daily, uh, were given. Then surgery was performed. Warfarin restarted at, on the evening of surgery or at day one. And depending on the severity of surgery and the periopathy uh, hemostasis, uh, um, either daltepine or placebo were restarted either at day one or day three. The results are quite striking. 
The mean shot score uh, was 2.3, and the range uh, uh, was between 1 to 6. About 38% of the patients had the shot score of uh, 3 or higher, but that means also that 62% had a lower shot score. 34% of the patients were taking aspirin and 7% were taking another antiplatelet agent. The mean number of the study drug administered was 5 before surgery and 16 after surgery. And there were no difference in arterial thromboembolism, but there was a huge increase in major bleeding, and for th emphasizing the danger of, of bridging in this patient. But remember that these were only atrial fibrillation patients. So what should we do? I think that the best way to know what to do is to focus on the risk. Very nicely, in 2016, Spiropoulos and Ducatis, who was the author of uh, the bridge study, have issued some recommendation and they have suggested a patient-related risk stratification, which, which is quite easy. You may see that a patient with a high risk here on, on the left, with 10% per year risk of arterial thrombosis and more than 10% per month risk of venous thromboembolism, the intermediate risk 4 to 10% per year for arterial and 4 to 10% per month for venous thromboembolism, and less than 4% for the low risk of uh, arterial and 2% for uh, uh, the <coughs> venous thromboembolism. And then the patients were split into three groups, mechanical, heart valve, atrial fibrillation, and venous thromboembolism. But even if the area uh, of the red surface is greater than the uh, other one, it's obvious that uh, most of the patient sit in this situation with a shot score of two, three to four, or even lower, zero to two for atrial fibrillation, or a VT risk uh, within the past three to 12 months, uh, or recurrent VTE, or VTE more than 12 months ago. This subset of patient inside the red uh, surface is very small, all the mechanical valve patient, atrial patients, uh, atrial fibrillation patients with a high shot score of five to six, which is the maximum, and very recent venous tumor embolism, severe thrombophilia, deficiency of protein C, protein S, or fibrin, antiphospholipids, antibodies, or multiple thrombophilia. Thank you for attention. Mark, thank you. Thank you very much. It was. Um of course, so important to discuss the, this situation of uh, having to bridge. But in fact, Mark, uh, is it frequent to bridge uh, patients? Uh? It, it, it should be less and less frequent. Still, some patients on vitamin K antagonists are bridged. We have very few uh, mechanical valve patients. All these patients should be bridged. But uh, now, uh, I have to uh, confess that most of my colleagues are really reluctant not to bridge the patient because they are scared. And these data, uh, first bridge study, the meta-analysis by Seagull and the recommendation by uh, uh, Spiropoulos should move to a very small subset of patients to be bridged, very few patients, only very high-risk patients. And we do not meet such patients very often. In fact, uh, Mark, do you differentiate patients with mitral and aortic uh, valve uh, in practice? Do you think, uh, because the, the risk is different, of course, thromboembolism is higher in mitral valve position prosthesis, so is it different for you when the patient has uh, only an aortic valve prosthesis? Well, obviously in fact, in, in, in real world. Obviously, the risk with the aortic valve is, is smaller, but uh, um, the uh, French authorities' uh, recommendation 10 years ago, and even uh, uh, Spiropoulos and Ducatis, uh, eight years after, put all the valve patients in the same group. We all know that aortic valve deserves less uh, uh, prevention, of course. But I think that uh, uh, for the um, uh, sake of uh, prudence, we should put all the mechanical valve patients in the same group. Mark, uh, can, we give, uh, can you give to all the people here 
the, the way you are really bridging with, with heparin. How, how, would you, how would you manage this? Well, in 2008, it was the first time that uh, low molecule weight heparins were allowed to be used for bridging, and I think they are really convenient. You should give the last dose either of, of uh, warfarin uh, uh, or um, uh, fluindium in France. Fluindium is 84% of the market in France, which is the most available uh, 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 vitamin K antagonist. At last intake at day minus uh, five, exactly as in the bridge study, nothing given at day minus four, and then you will start the low molecular weight heparin curative dose, I mean 100 uh, international units per kilo twice daily, either starting on the morning of day three, day minus three, or even in the evening, depending on the vitamin K antagonist, the same thing on day minus two, uh, in the morning and in the evening, and the last dose should be given 24 hours before surgery, meaning that you will give the last sub-Q injection at the minus one in the morning. Mark, uh, well, can, you, can we imagine that we are at the end of the bridging period? Uh, when can we resume the usual uh, treatment? Day one, day two, day four? Most of the accident, and especially we have some data in, in orthopedic surgery, occur during the bridging period when there is an overlap uh, uh, of the vitamin K antagonist, which restarts, and the low molecular weight heparin. At that time, there is a huge danger. So I would not be in a hurry, and I, for myself, I would restart at day three with no hurry, because the risk at day one or day two is quite small. The traumatic risk, if, even if the patient have a, an inflammatory syndrome, they are postoperative, of course. But the bleeding risk is much more consequent. So you have to take care, and we have some data in, in surgery showing that you have better to delay the restart of vitamin K antagonist at day three or day four. And uh, maybe another way to do, uh, has been developed by Nadia Rosenscher a few uh, years ago, unfortunately it's not yet approved, but restart with DOAX in atrial fibrillation patient, not in mechanical valve patient. And then later on, uh, the uh, general practitioner will do uh, the shift from DOAX to vitamin K antagonist. So there will be no overlap period, only a DOAC postoperatively. Post Mark, are you suggesting that orthopedic surger surgery is a specific situation because of the bleeding risk, or you think that it's well? It's a well, well known it's maybe it's the, the clinical setting where bleeding is more obvious and where bleeding is, let's say, more dangerous, especially in prosthetic surgery, I would say knee surgery. And we have some data in knee surgery showing that some accidents occur. We don't have such data in other surgical settings as general surgery or, or thoracic surgery. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I have very You're welcome. few questions, quick questions, quick answer, because it's urgent questions. So is there a specific cutoff uh, for a second antidote dose? Sarah, it's for you. <coughs> The, the cutoff for express for first dose is uh, above or equal to 50 nanogram per ml. So if the patient is still bleeding and it's over this cutoff, I would suggest um, if he has a severe bleeding and to to consider this as a cutoff. So 50. Thank you, Sarah. What about desmopressin use in urgent surgery in patients on clopidogrel, wave, Cardio cardiologic patients, uh, Anne? We are we are quite far from uh, <laughs> the field yeah. of anticoagulants, so this is more anti plaquette agents. I think that for today th there are no very robust data to support the use of desmopressin. So I think that desmopressin should not be the first choice. And I have one last question for you, Mark. It's a tough question. How to know if a patient with atrial fibrillation but without an embolic event wouldn't have a first embolic event during the non-bridging period. I think it's a kind of test. Well, it's a very difficult question, and I have only 25 seconds left. Maximum, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that it's almost impossible to know that. Thank you, Mark. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to Anne, Sarah, Pierre, and Mark for this uh, session uh, on... Uh, bleeding and urgent surgery and elective surgery, dealing with all the problems with uh, uh, perioperative anticoagulant treatment. So uh, I hope to see you uh, very soon. Thank you very much to everybody. <laughs>